be it a national park, wildlife sanctuary, biosphere reserve, or community reserve. Protected areas are critical in safeguarding biodiversity, maintaining ecosystem balance, and building resilience against climate change. However, despite the enormous importance of protected areas, they've often come under immense pressure from encroachments. In today's edition of the program, we are going to be talking about biodiversity conservation and the role of protected areas in enhancing conservation. A case study for today's edition of the program is a corrupt national park, one of Cameroon's most biologically diverse forests. When we come back, we shall meet our guest. It is a park that has been described as one of the richest lowland African forests. Headquartered in Indian Division, the corrupt national park since its creation in 1986 has been one of Cameroon's most visited tourist destinations, and for good reason. These camera trap videos shows the adorable moment when world's largest land mammal, the African elephant, leads its tribe. The African elephant play an important role in balancing the natural ecosystem and are great seed dispersal agents. If you think that was adorable, wait until you see this moment, this drill, locally called Sumbo, fools her baby upon noticing the apparent presence of a camera. Then comes this adorable video of the Nigeria Cameroon chimpanzee carrying their babies on their backs like humans. The subspecies of chimpanzee, also known as Pantroglodytes elioti, which inhabits the rainforest along Nigeria Cameroon border, is classified endangered on the IUCN Red List, with a high risk of extinction due to habitat destruction, hunting, and pet trade. Also present in the Karob National Park are pangolins, as can be seen in these camera trap videos. Pangolins fall under category A of classified wildlife species in Cameroon, which fully protects them from hunting or exploitation. Pangolins, locally known as catapith, have in the last decade come under immense pressure. They are hunted for meat and are used in traditional medicine. Their skills are used as fashion accessories, particularly in China and Vietnam. Whereas pangolins are guardians of the forest, they protect the forest from termite destruction, maintaining a balanced ecosystem. The Corrupt National Park is also home to a good population of the young forest buffalo caught in these camera traps. Apart from fauna, the park is also blessed with a variety of rare and endemic flora species. In today's edition of the program, we are receiving a forestry engineer with over a decade experience in biodiversity conservation. He's equally the conservator of the Corrupt National Park with headquarters in the Indian Division of the Southwest Region. He is Mr. Tabi Derek Tabe. Thank you so much for joining us in today's edition of the program, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me to your program. We are talking about protected area management. Before we go to talk about how they help conserve biodiversity, it will be interesting for us to first of all know what is a protected area and what are the different types of protected areas we have. Thank you very much for that question. Let me start by saying that Cameroon forest management is being managed through a legal document that is called the 1994 Forestry Law. Okay. And in that law, it specifies how protected areas are supposed to be managed in Cameroon. And in that law, in that document, forest in Cameroon is being is classified in two categories. You have okay. the permanent forest and the non-permanent forest. Okay. And most the protected areas in Cameroon will fall within the permanent forest zone in Cameroon. Okay. Yeah. Now, can you tell us about some of the different protected areas we have in Cameroon? Yes, the protected areas we have in Cameroon that fall within the national forest domain. We have the national parks, okay. we have the game reserve, okay. we have the botanic gardens, and the zoology garden, like the Limbe zoology garden that we have just behind us here in Limbe. Okay. We have also game ranches, we have sanctuaries, and uh, what again, we have um, um, game reserves as well okay. in Cameroon. 
and also hunting zones. Hunting zone. Because you remember that hunting zone is also a protected area. Okay. They classified as you know, you know, for for the production of bush meat, especially for community consumption, and also for to raise funds for the state. Okay, we are talking about protected areas, and our focus into this edition of the program is a corrupt national park, which has been described as one of Cameroon's most biologically diverse parks. Talk to us about the corrupt national park and how diverse this park is. The corrupt national park was created on the 30th of October 1986, and it covers a surface area of 1,260 square kilometers, and it covers three administrative units, with the largest part of the Corrupt National Park being in the Indian Division, part being in Mani Division, and another being in Kupe Maniguba Division, that is around the Nguti area where we have some villages. Okay. And the Corrupt National Park covers 32 villages found within and inside the National Park. And it shares a very contiguous boundary with the Republic of Nigeria in the Crossover National Park, that is in the urban division of the Crossover Park in Nigeria. And how biologically diverse is the Corrupt National Park in terms of fauna and flora? Wow, the Corrupt National Park, it was just created for the sake of creation. The Corrupt National Park is a biodiversity hotspot. Okay. Where we have many different kinds of species of animals in the Corrupt National Park. And permit me, permit me say that Corrupt National Park is the first rainforest national park created in Cameroon and one of the largest rainforest national park in Africa. So you can begin to imagine the immensity of the biodiversity in the Corum National Park. When it comes to biodiversity um, in the Corum National Park, we have five endemic species in the Corum National Park. Okay. Here we are talking about the elephants, we are talking about the drill, we are talking about the, the, the mandrill, the red colobos. And, uh, and even the lately you were talking about pangolins, yes, which are also the, very threatened today. Yes. You know, Corum National Park also hosted this giant pangolin that is almost being extinct today. But with, you know, pictures that we had from our camera traps, you know, pangolins have been spotted in the Corum National Park. And also from um, reports from our cluster facilitators, those that mean we have some community members that we have, that are working in close collaboration with the park, with the park service. They have told us that they have seen these giant pangolins in some areas around Cluster A, around the Ekono Manojongari area. But since we have not yet started the camera trap expedition around that area, they are still to believe what they are telling us. They have made us understand that we have those giant pangolins around that area. And, you know, pangolin today has become, it has shifted from class B to class, class A. a because of the threat that had the pressure, been, the pressure on this. That on is being hunted for its skills. For its skills, for its, you know, flesh. And, you know, the pangolin had become, you know, on the spot. And a few weeks ago, the pangolin, the way pangolin was celebrated. And uh, it was... It was, it was an opportunity, it was to, opportunity raise to, to raise awareness, awareness about, about the, the, the dangers, dangers that the species is, is, is facing. facing. Now, that is in terms of fauna. What about flora? Talking about the tree species that are found in this park. Okay, for the tree species that are found in this park, we cannot talk about flora without talking about fauna. Because for the Coral National Park to be very rich, these two must work together to make the park to be biodiversically diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, as I said earlier, we have five endemic species of animal that we have there, elephants, have the chimpanzee, the drill, the red colobos, and the, the the drill, the elephants. The, okay, fine. Then we go back to plant species. We have about 33 families of plants. Okay. I with about um, uh, 60, 161 species of mammals, including rare and endangered and threatened species. But we are talking about this um, uh, giant pangolin because if you look at the endemic species, we don't have pangolin. When we talk about the threatened species, we bring in the pangolin inside because it is really, really haunted yes. in the area. Then going about again for the bird species, we have about 410 species of birds okay. in the Corum National Park. We have 55 species of bat, 82 reptile species, 92 species of amphibian, that is the frogs, that is animals that live in between water and land. And, land. and we also have 130 fish species in the Corum National Park. We have 900 and 
50 species of butterflies in the Colum National Park, 3,500 vascular plants, of which 5% are endemic. Can you imagine that 3,500 plant species in, in the, the Colum National, yes. National Park? And 623 species and shrubs, of which 30% are endemic. And we have 480 species of mama, of medicinal plants, herbs, and you know, there is this plant that we talk about every day. This Because the research is being done. Research but is being done when you that. look at these plants and animal species, the different animals that are found, you've mentioned elephants, you've mentioned drills, you've mentioned chimpanzees, and you've spoken about uh, pangolins. What are the biggest threats these animals face today? The biggest threat that these animals face today in Cameroon, especially in the Coral National Park, is poaching. Okay. You know, Coral National Park, as I said earlier, shares a very contiguous boundary with Nigeria. Okay. And most of these are boundaries are porous. You know, so poachers leave Nigeria, come in, come and poach, and they go back. This is something that we have been struggling together with the communities. We have created village forest management communities and communities that have been helping us to, you know, to start to see how they can send, the, send them out. And some of these poachers are having, you know, heavy weapons, which sometimes don't weapons, which sometimes don't match up with what the eco guards get. From what I, from what I understand. From for the Coral National Park, looking at the area that we are working, you know, we are fortunate that we use mostly mostly den guns and traps. I know the trap is blind. The trap doesn't see the kind of animal to, to hunt that it kills. And somebody may come in the park and maybe put in maybe 1,000 traps. He may not have that time to go into the park to verify, to make sure that he sees all the traps to get all the animals. You put a trap and the trap stays there for two weeks, three weeks. You don't, you don't check it and before you know it, many animals have died on the trap and you know, it is, it, it's a lot of wastage for, for the animals. You know, it kills a lot and to us it's not a good thing. That's why um, we have developed a strategy that we get community members you know, who go into the park to remove some of these traps. Okay. When they remove the traps, they destroy them. And, you know, for that, it keeps the park a little bit healthy. But the biggest threat, as I said earlier, is poaching. poaching. Now, as a protected area, how does the Corrupt National Park help to enhance biodiversity conservation? For, to enhance biodiversity conservation, you know, first of all, it's a protected area. Okay. Where everything in the protected area is supposed to be kept untouched. Okay. Yes, it's supposed to be kept untouched. Nobody is supposed to be in the protected area to harvest whatsoever. That's why the Coron National Park, if you look at the, the map of the Coron National Park, it has been divided into various zones. Because in as much as we are doing biodiversity conservation, we too should also make sure that the people living within the community feel a little bit, they feel, you know, happy. They you can exercise get their users' right yes. within the park. That's why the Coron National Park has been divided into, into four zones. We have the core zone where we have all of these key species that are, that is where, because they have shown that this is where the most of the, the are. key species are, are located. And this area covers more than 70% of the surface area of the protected of the Coral National Park. We have also this, um, what you call the limited access zone. It's another area where community members, it's about 1.5 kilometers from the core zone, where community members can exercise their users' right. Okay. They can go there to get bush mango, they can go there to get jangsa, no they can go there to get for people like Iru yes. for their own consumption. And we have the fragile ecosystem as well. This fragile ecosystem, these are places where, you know, the, the ecosystem there is not as, you know, any, anything that would do the excess in excess is going to destroy the habitat. And all of this have been, have been uh, carved out. And this was not done just by the park service, it was done together with the community, community. members. So, so they know exactly where they are supposed to exercise their rights. And you know, when I was making the first presentation, I said we have about 32 villages in and around the Coron National Park. And for management purpose, for management reason, we have some villages that are found inside the Coron National Park. Okay. You know, that's why we came up with a strategy, with a model to create permanent use zone inside the Coron National Park in villages that are found within, because no villages, according to the law, is supposed to be found, found within inside the park. the park. So for management reasons, because we cannot take them out, this is place where, these are, these are places where they were born. Yeah, ancestral land. Yeah, ancestral land. You know, so 
with, with the Ministry of Forest and Wildlife, we decided to carve that area and call it a permanent use zone with a management plan and a whole document to make sure that this particular area like this, you can exercise all the rights that you have without crossing the boundaries to go and disturb, go and do whatever into the national park itself. And would you say that this is helping to protect the animal species to conserve biodiversity in essence? For sure, for sure. Because and if, how so? For, for, because the reason is that when these permanent zones were created, it's a big area, not a small area. If I take the case of one of the villages that we are working with, you know, the, the, the permanent use zone is about 9,000 hectares, about 9,000 to 10,000 hectares. So 10,000 hectares for a community that you have not up to even 300 people, it is big. So we took into consideration the land that they are already living inside and then extended also to make sure that even in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, they will see half land without necessarily going into a national park because if you leave the place open, people will decide to do whatever they want to do because the land is open. But with a management document that has been put in place, a management committee for the land that has been allocated to them, we'll be able to make sure that if you want land to extend your farm, they'll be able to give you a minimum of, let me say, one hectare or two okay. hectares to extend your farm. And until that farm has been well established, you, may, you cannot ask for more land. Now, let's talk about a normal day at the Korob National Park. What are you and your team up to? Okay. The Korob National Park works with a with a, what you call a work plan. We have EcoGuards, the conservator, and other conservation partners that are working with the Korob National Park. And based on our annual work plan, what we do is that on a normal day, we we have EcoGuards are going for patrols. We have EcoGuards are going for normal, you know. Um, um, you know, development activities. Okay. And I want to say that the Corona National Park is blessed to have the program for the sustainable management of natural resources that have been supporting activities in the Corona National Park since 2006. Okay. And this program, you know, has helped to bring in a lot of development initiative in the communities. Okay. Yes. So, in as much as we are doing the repressive activity, we are also doing a development what? activity. Okay. But on a normal day, if work has to go the way it's supposed to be go to go, sorry, the Echo Guards are supposed to go for at least a minimum of a 15-day anti-poaching patrol okay. within a defined area in the protected area, where they go not just to look at the animal population, they go there also to look at encroachment. If people have made farms in the park, if people are hunting in the park, if they see anything that has to do with hunting, they destroy, they remove traps, they arrest hunters in the park, and most especially. They go in for sensitization. Okay. Because in the protected area management, what if somebody is being arrested, that is the last procedure because the first thing that we do as a protected area is, is to sensitize, keep sensitize the, com the, the community. The because sensitization is a continuous process. You may think that they know everything, but they don't know. So you keep talking to them, you keep talking to them. And it's only in the rare case where somebody has taken it as a right, who doesn't want to listen to conservation, to the conservation story, to what we are telling them that we can go now for what you call an arrest. And just in line with what you're talking about, uh, about what a day looks like at the Corrupt National Park, you've mentioned the role of EcoGuard. I just want you to come back a bit for our audience, some people who may not know who is an EcoGuard. You cannot talk about a national park without an EcoGuard. Sure. Who is an EcoGuard and what is their role in biodiversity conservation with the case of Corrupt, of course? Okay, thank you. An EcoGuard is a, is a trained forester. Okay who have gone through a formal training and have been posted to a protected area by the Ministry of Forestry and Wildlife. We have a national forestry school in Bamayo. There's another one in Lima, the National Wildlife School in, in Garwa, sorry, where they train these eco guards who come and work in protected areas, who have been trained for this kind of activities, for anti-poach, for repression activities, for sensitization activities, for development activities, for all kinds of activities that you. That's why an Ekuga who leaves any of the, the, the forest institution in Bamayo can fit anywhere in where, where we have forest activities going on. Talk to us about ecotourism at the Corrupt National Park and how it helps to bring in income. Okay, when it comes to ecotourism, first of all, the Corrupt National Park is, is an ecotourism and a research has a big ecotourism and a big research potential. Okay. When it comes to ecotourism, we have 
the Mana Food Bridge. Wow. Yeah, I've been there. Famous Mana Food Bridge. I have been there and I must say that it was a wonderful experience yeah. seeing the Mana Food Bridge. It's magnificent. The air from the forest is just wonderful. I just wanted to make that remark about the Mana Food Bridge. Thank you. And I would have loved that this interview is conducted around the Mana Food Bridge. Because subsequently, subsequently, hope you're going to we'll invite go, us yes, there. Subsequently, we'll go there. But of course, our viewers will have the chance to see the pictures on the screen. Thank you very much. So we have the Mana Food Bridge. We have the Ringo Rock. Okay. Which is like, you know, an area that it was as if something, they just came and placed a very big stone. Okay. We have waterfalls. We have caves. We have what we call the Namata ledges. Okay. Which is a particular area around the park where you go It's as if... That particular, you know, kind of plants were planted around that area. You see, it's very, very beautiful. You have caves. Wow. And we have, you know, I talked about the two villages around the, 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 the Coromar National Park. These villages have their diverse culture, their diverse cultural activities. They attend the way they dress, their houses, the kind of food they eat. All of these things, they build up to form the strong ecotourism potential of the Coromar National Park. Talking about research, research in Coromar National Park you know, before the advent of the crisis, we had at least five researchers in the Coromandel National Park on a yearly basis wow. when they come. And remember that the Simisuna Institute that had worked with the Coromandel National Park since its inception has a 50 hectares plot where students come there and carry off research activities in the, in, in, in the plot for so many different things. A lot of things are being done. But unfortunately for, for us, for the past years, because of the crisis, we've not been able to receive tourists in the Coromandel National Park because you know the road leading to Coromandel National Park is through Kumba, passing through those villages down there. But we've not been able to have tourists for now. But before the advent of the crisis, Coromandel will receive a minimum of 1,000 tourists on a yearly, on a yearly basis. basis. And most of the tourists are coming from outside Cameroon. Now, you just mentioned uh, the Anglophone crisis, which I would say that. Uh, has definitely impacted most areas in the Northwest and Southwest region. The Corrup National Park cannot be an exception. Tell us how the crisis has affected the park. Oh, Madam, the crisis has really dealt with the park squarely. The Corrup National Park is be buoyant, with tourists flooding in and out, with activities echo guard on a monthly basis on patrol. These activities have slowed down to a bare minimum. And now for us... Because of insecurity. Because of insecurity. And you know, the Coromandel National Park is a highway from the Manafo Bridge to those villages that these boys, these boys cross to go to Nigeria. Okay. So most of the time, the boys cross to the, the, the Coromandel National Park into their... because most of them go to Nigeria. Okay. And just imagine that an eco guard who is being patrolled with a gun in a protected area, what will happen to him? You know, it is obvious that many, many things uh, stupid may happen to him. Mm -hmm. And for security reasons, the administration of Ndian decided to, to stop all activities that have to do with, with, with firearms. Okay. That's why even eco guards, they cannot even go into the park to, to carry out patrol. Okay. But through PSM now, we had an adapted strategy. That's what I was going to come yes, to. That they will have an adapted strategy where we, we, we on this phase four that we are already most rounding up phase four, we have what called engagement strategy, where we identified the main management issues in the protected in the Coron National Park. Where we have poaching, we have uh, because the management issues in the park we have poaching, we have timber exploitation, river poisoning, insect collection. But since as poaching is a big, is a you biggest know the threat. biggest threat in the park, we identified some of these poachers in some of the clusters that we are working inside, and the poachers were identified, and then we sensitize them to give them a different livelihood option. As we speak, Corrupt have trained more than 100 poachers, identified poachers. Some are already in OIC doing different vocational training. Okay. Some who never wanted to do vocational training are in the communities because they were, because before being a poacher, they are all farmers. Okay. And they wanted their farm to be upgraded. So they gave them upgraded seeds of cocoa and a bush mango to put in their farm so much so that even if he's not going into the park to hunt again, he'll be able to take care of his farm and they have a big harvest where he can sell his product, his produce and have much money. As I said, we have already trained more than 100 um, poachers, and five poachers that are in OIC already. Just imagine 100 poachers. Just imagine that the these impact. 100 poachers were to kill at least one, one animal, elephant. one animal, animal every week. Just imagine that we have saved the life of 
every month we are saving like, at least 100 animals. You, since as we're, we're talking about the impact of the crisis, you also spoke about the fact that uh, there has also been a kind of a, a, a good side. There has been a reduction on the pressure and the, the, not, the population of some species is thriving. Yes. If I talk about the population of some species thriving, I talk about the elephants. Because the good thing is that since the advent of the crisis was not reported, nobody in the community, because we have key informants in the communities where they give us information. And since 2017 up to date, we've not had a case of an elephant being killed. It, it must have happened, but it might not be that, you know. As it was as, before. As it was before. We've not had any case of any, any case of elephant being killed. And as I said earlier, the last time I went to the park, you see a lot of elephant trees because when an elephant passes here, you know that an elephant has passed. When you see, you know, um, um, when you are moving, you hear monkeys jumping left and right. You hear you know, the, the cries of this animal. You see there are yeah. dogs everywhere. Tells you that the animals, the, 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 the park is becoming healthier. I mean, the park is healthier and the touristic potential is still very high. Yes. Now, despite the crisis, are there any measures that are being put in place to make sure that lovers of tourism can still go to the Corrupt National Park and enjoy this haven? Yes, yes. For now, you know, we have created conservation clubs okay. in, in communities and in schools. Where we wanted, we wanted to use this, because tomorrow is celebrated as World Wildlife Day. Exactly. Where we wanted to use this March as well, March 3rd. You know, that we wanted to use this day to celebrate, to go back to the community in Mundemba, get students, get some of these posters that we have identified, the bushmeat dealers, the motorbike that are carrying the bushmeat from wherever they are coming. So much that we can synergize our efforts to make them know that together we can protect the put, uh, wildlife in the Corona National. And of Park. course, the World Wildlife Day this year has been celebrated under the theme Recovering Species for Ecosystem Restoration. You know, if, if that is being done, because I remember in the days of the Corona Project, I was still very, very young. We discovered that there was a lot of bushmeat around Mundeba. They still yet, you go to the park, you see animals running left and right. The issue that the park is not against people eating bushmeat. Okay. What the park is against is where people get the bushmeat and the kind that they get. The park is like a hospital for the animals. That protected area that is like a community park is like a hospital. You discover that even in hospitals, nobody is allowed, during war, nobody is allowed to go and touch, touch something in the hospital. This is the message I've been passing to them. When the carrying capacity of the park is very, very high, these animals will live and come and meet you right in your farm beside your house. And we are not, as I said, we are not against the kill of bushmeat, except for particular species like the class A species that are struggling to build up so much so that they can get to a certain, a certain height, a certain level. Again, we are making them that if you want to deal with bushmeat, come and meet us. We'll tell you the kind of documents that you will need. Because, as I said, the park, the ministry is not against people dealing with bushmeat. Before you to do that, you must have the, the, the legal document. And of course, there are types of species that, that you need you, to. We are rounding up with this interview. Just want to find out from you, you have any last words? Uh, for now, the last word that I have is that we are praying that this crisis should come to an end. Because the Corona National Park is heaven on earth. You need to visit it. It's, it's one of the largest rainforests in Africa. And it has a lot of potential. It is still intact, and we are begging that this crisis should come to a stop. So much that the people who live within the Corona National Park start enjoying the benefits because they are already in. So I said enjoying the benefits because we talked about students, people, voters now doing mechanic driving, doing woodwork, and other things to, to, to increase their livelihood. If and of course, time, when there are tourists, businesses try. Businesses try. So the people in the community will also benefit. I remember also before, before, before now. They have some hotels that were built in, in, in Munemba. And these hotels were always, being, uh, always getting full because people were always coming. Coming in. Tourists tourist. coming in on a daily basis. But now, since 2017, we've not received even one tourist in the Corona That's National really Park. That's really bad. You can imagine the blow in their face. A park guys will receive 500 up to 1,000 tourists, all coming from abroad. They truly have not had any because nobody can risk taking the road to Munemba. And you know... Now you now go through the high seas. We now to go through the high seas. And nobody... 
So, so may not, not everybody will have that some some courage, courage to go through the sea to, to get to the mm. In a nutshell, we are hoping that maybe the crisis comes to an end and the uh, tourism potential, the park can flourish once again. The park will flourish as it has ever been. Korom National Park is the pride of, of the Africa. South. Africa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Tabi Derek, for accepting our invitation on Planet Rise. It was such a pleasure having you. Pleasure is fine. And I'm hoping to see you again at the subsequently. Corrupt hopefully. And for all of you who have been watching at home, thank you so much for watching. We shall be back again in a fortnight with another interesting topic. But for now, it's goodbye and God bless.